everyone. My name is Steve Zeitlin, and I want to welcome you to Be the Change, a friendship called Undugo. Thank you for coming to part two of the series. And though you're all muted at the moment, we will unmute you all for questions and answers. And I want to be sure you all stay for the participatory finale at the end. On behalf of City Lore, Annie and Simba, we'd like to thank Phyllis and the Nurse Practitioner Healthcare Foundation, Andy Engel, Stacey Abramson, and the Reimagine Life, Love and Loss Festival, Eva and Molly from City Lore, and Mike Fiorito, who will be fielding your questions on the chat. So please don't forget to write questions throughout on the chat. Please remember to put your computer on speaker view because if you're seeing all the speakers in a very tiny little box, be sure to click on the right, on the top right of your screen so we appear full screen. And with great pleasure, I introduce our artist tonight. Simba Yingala was born in Lumbubashi. She is an educator, dancer, choreographer, storyteller, and performer an artistic director of the Jungle Dom Network. She tours with her show, What Forgiveness Looks Like, a fundraiser for four Congolese orphans. And to recap, in part one, she spoke beautifully about her mom, who doesn't speak English, watching George Floyd crying to his mother just before he died. Her mother understood him as crying for all mothers, and felt compelled to go to the protests with a sign about mothers in her language, Luba Kasai. She also talked about her grandmother's death in Congo during the quarantine and her grandmother's last wish to look down from heaven to see how the pandemic finally ended. May we all live to see that day. Annie Lanzalato is a Bronx born performance artist, author, poet, songwriter, actor, and writing teacher. Annie's greatest love growing up, as many of you know, was the Spalding, that your New Yorkism for the ball that became ubiquitous on New York City streets. The Spalding, to recap, taught Annie's soul to find adventure, to fly, to roll, to hide, to float, to be buoyant, to bounce. But the Spalding that she slept with under her pillow also became her fabulous metaphor for bouncing back from many years struggling with lymphoma and cancer. I had the pleasure to actually review Annie's book, Ellis for Lion, an Italian Bronx freedom memoir. And I, as I wrote, the book is essential reading as the most powerful depiction I have ever read of how a human being can draw on her folk culture, her humor, and her poetic, poetic insight to pull life-affirming meaning, meaning out of the gutter like a lost Spaldine. So we thought that for tonight, the Spaldine can be a metaphor for all of us. May we someday and always bounce back. So I'm going to remind us, I want to throw this quasi Spaldine to Simba and start by asking her some questions and she'll then toss the ball to Annie. I want to, her to remind us of what Nundugo means, what she means by slavery in slow motion caught on film, and can you catch this ball? Is she muted? <laughs> you have to unmute yourself. Okay, one second. There you are. Did you catch it? Oh, yes. I did catch it. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Steve, you better throw that ball one more time. Okay. Thank you. Here, she, here you go. Oh, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, uh, my name, should I go with my name? Uh, it's everyone is born and you are given a name. And in the Democratic Republic of Congo, your name is appraisal. So you get praise all your life with the name that was given to you. Simbanyota wakatolo inabanza waluba Sandra Yangala. Museleke te dese anime akufakate Django Dom Queen 
Reine de Matiti, 23h59, Oboi Fanda. You should try that with your Ndugus, your children. You get their names and you get to praise them. Any, Lanzilato Ndugu of New York, Acha, Minaya, Sema, Soya, San Secantro. See, you can do it. You just put praise to someone's name. You know what I love, Simba, about you say a name comes to you and grows with you. you your name keeps changing and growing. The pray, because I was named after Simbanyota Wakatolo Ina Banzawalu. So in my birth, I did more with that name. So all that will be added to my name. So Django Dom Queen, Ren de Matiti Museleketa Kufarate de Sanime. So you hear the Jungle Dome Network and Jungle Dome Queen. So it's things I've done <coughs> in my life. So they get added to your name. So that's the praise. Simba, I have a question. Can I start with, with a question? Sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for spending this hour all together. We all need the healing circle. Simba, last week uh, you told us in your name that Sandra, is from the Belgian colonial part of your experience. And one of the questions came up, what's the difference between growing up in Africa under colonialism and slavery as an African-American in the United States of America? Transformation of the same thing. Uh, you can say slavery, you can say colonialism. The struggle looks similar, they look the same. The, so it's either you take someone out of their land into another land to work, or you come into their land, take their land away from them and make them work. I see. And you would say, and that's why your mother made sure you knew French perfectly. It was, it has been a great grief with uh, the death of George Floyd, my brother George Floyd, and just all these things that come out with us having conversations with, with our parents. You know, they tell you, go back to Africa. And then you sit for a while and our parents had said, Africa was taken away from me. I can't give it to you. So it was taken away from our parents. So they couldn't give it to us. They had to give us an accent in French. Je devais être Sandra Yangala, you know, to fit in the new world that was created for my parents and how they couldn't pass on Africa to me. So uh, my, you see, in my grandmother's name, there's also Therese. So my mother is Anastasie, Anastasie Hollande. And I am Sandra, you know, the colonial heritage. So learning French was a survival skill. Learning French was a survival skill. It was the, I think the alternative of my parents giving what they have left of their land of, their identity. Oh, Simba, I forgot to feed the meter. You got a call? Oh, sure, I do. Interrupt. Catch it. Catch it. Uh, thanks. I'm sorry to huh? interrupt you. We'll get right back to that. Sure. But you know, you got to feed time, especially in New York. You pay for every minute. Okay. All right, we got it. All right, so. But I interrupted you. You want to finish? Sure. And then throw me the ball when you finish. Oh, uh, okay. another question. He asked you um about your visage. Um, maquillage. Your maquillage. My maquillage. Uh, is it different than the one I I had last time? Yes. It. This is togetherness. Last time I had majestic. This time I have togetherness. All right. All right, you want to throw me the ball? Sure. Any, can you catch it? Ready. Here we go. Ready. Oh, catch it. <laughs> you got it. You got it, you got it. All right, first, we got to have a little public health message. So when you're sheltering in place alone, you do some strange things. I've been alone, as I said last week, since March, third and then March 7th when I got out of the hospital. Now, I find it strange, you know, Simba, one of the things me and you got in common is what? 
survival of different things. But we share a lot about how to survive, right? Yes. What I find strange is that people look to the government for cues how to survive. This is crazy. This is pot so. Now, take hand washing, for example. I want to get some suds on me. Guess what year the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, recommended hand washing as a mode of prevention for viruses and bacteria and infection? Take a guess. Simba, Steve, give me a guess. 1933? No. I'll give you a hint. During the Civil War, we had a very smart nurse in this country. Her name was Florence Nightingale. And in the 1800s, she was the biggest proponent of hand washing to save soldiers' lives. Guess how long it took for the CDC to catch up. That's the government. Century? Yes! You're so brilliant. A century. The CDC mentioned hand washing during the AIDS crisis. That's the mid 1980s. So between the Civil War, when slavery was still an institution, the government didn't catch up with hand washing until the AIDS crisis. So we need each other. We are the experts. If the government says four feet away, don't stand four feet away. If the government says six feet away, don't believe in six feet away. We have to tap into our inner wisdom. You know, my mother, Raquel Claire Petrozelli Lancilotto, she never needed an infectious disease expert. She was the infectious disease expert. My grandmother, Rosa Marsico Petrozelli, she never needed an infectious disease expert. These women could scare the life out of bacteria and viruses on animals, on people, on your head. They could hear it in your chest and they knew what to do. And in the house, of course. And guess what my mother always said was the best disinfectant. I'm looking at you, Simba. What's the number one best disinfectant? Your instinct. Okay, well, I'm not gonna dispute that. Your instinct is good. But what my mother said was the sun. Mm. I'm sure you know that. Every morning, she'd make sure, as all mothers know, open the windows, let in the sun, hang clothes on the clothesline, let the sun disinfect everything. Mm. Even if you have a wound, you're supposed to put it in the sun. Mm. Right? Okay. Um, back to the meter. Oh, you know, one more thing about that. I got two more things to say about that. When I was studying public health in Egypt, I went to the Egyptian Ministry of Health. And the Egyptian Minister of Health told me a story. And he said, this president of Egypt, I won't name names, he said to the scientist, he said, if you, Mr. Scientist, come up with the cure for schistosomiasis, we'll cut off your head. Now, why did he say that? Why do governments need people to be sick? There's a lot of reasons. More reasons than we could go into here. But I'll just say one reason. In Egypt, the peasant class, the class my grandparents came from, they had to be exhausted because if the peasant class has energy, they're gonna to start to dream. And if the peasant class starts to dream, they're gonna want happiness in their lives and fulfillment. And then the government's in trouble. And isn't that a little bit of what we're seeing in the streets right now? I'm gonna start with a prayer. Ave Maria, grazie plena, Signore, contese, benedicta della donna, benedicta frutto del grumbo Gesù. Santa Maria, Madre di Dio, prega per noi, peccatori, adesso è l'ora della nostra morte. Tonight might be the night that I die. Let's keep it real. Tonight might be the night that I die, but it's all right. 
I recommend you all do that with a parking meter. Now, Simba, I know in response to a question that we had last week, you wrote a manifesto and a story came to you in a dream, in a vision. Before we get to that, I want to ask one more public health question. In March, in April, in most of May, what was the number one word we heard about if you were watching the mainstream news? Four syllables, begins with a V. Anybody, Steve, you got an idea? Four syllables, begins with a V. Come on, Steve, I'm looking at you. You're talking about hey. vaccine? Close, close, Steve? Uh, geez, vaccine was a great guess. Okay, um, the word is ventilator, ventilator. Mm -hmm. We heard the government was spending $2.5 billion, I think. Don't, you know, you can fact check me on ventilators. All we heard was ventilators, 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 ventilators. Then at the end of May, George Floyd's trachea got crushed. And it hit me. Where was George Floyd's ventilators? Who were these ventilators for? Do black people in the street need a different kind of ventilator, a social just justice ventilator? And what does that look like? Now, I, I know a little bit about the trachea. My trachea is very damaged from radiation and surgery. In fact, it closes off on me. And if it happens in the middle of the show, I'll just disappear for a few minutes. And they say the worst that could happen is I pass out and then the body wakes up. So if, that, if I disappear, that's what happens. If you feel this dent, there's a notch under your Adam's apple. It's called the cricothyroid membrane. I carry around with me a trait kit. I got two of them. One is brass, I keep it on my belt loop. The other one's more sterile and it's a puncture process. This is what Joan Rivers needed when her doctor didn't have enough oxygen. If you need to breathe, Everyone should know how to help somebody. You have to puncture this cricothyroid membrane. So learn where it is. You could save someone's life in the street, in a restaurant. We have to know how to open up airways. And that's my little speech about that. And the last thing, the question that was asked last week that Simba's gonna talk her manifesto about was this. Joyce Ravitz is an activist for decades. She marched in the 60s. She did a lot of good. If she's in the room tonight, you could ask yourself. One of Joyce's questions was, why is part of the movement so segregated? And Simba's gonna talk on that. And um, before I turn it over you to, Sim to you, Simba, was there something I wanted to say to Joyce? I think there was, but I'm forgetting right now. Let me think. Why was the, why is, the, oh yeah, I know. Steve, guess who's in the, in the room tonight? My rabbi, Simka. I saw him come in. Now, for everyone who marched in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, whatever year, if you think we're in the same movement and you feel, in the moment, and you feel discouraged, if you say, what did we accomplish? Did we accomplish anything? Did electing Obama accomplish anything? Are we in the same moment? My rabbi Simka said, if you feel you're in the same moment, remember, we spiral up. Change happens like a spiral. So even if you think you're in the same moment, you're a level up. All right, Sim uh, Simba, Sandra, Wanoto, Mangala, Bushiki, Nabanza, Sandra, Yangala. I throw you the ball. Tell us your manifesto. I got it. Good catch. Thank you. I'm pinning you. If anyone else wants to pin Simba, she'll be really big on your screen. I can't pin myself. So um, uh, this piece is called This Space. So I'll read from a space. My Ndugu Annie called it a manifesto. I trust that. They say, 
it is said in many writings and books that slavery was abolished. July 4th, 1827. Wait, no, wait. Uh, that's, that's not the correct date. I'll, I'll start over. There's space. They say, it has been said in many books and writings that slavery was abolished. January 15th, 1929. So that's, that's not correct. That's that uh, I have to start over. So one second, I will start that off. <clears throat> this space. They say it is being written. It is said in many writings and books that slavery was abolished. August 28th. 1955. No, that's current event. It, uh, I think it was a little bit back than that. I'll start, I'll start over, I'll get this date correct. One moment, please bear with me. This space. They say, it is said in many writings and books that slavery was abolished January 31st, 1865. If I say today that is not correct, what kind of eyes will I be met with? If I say today that is not true, what sort of eyes would I be looked at with? If I say schools and universities teach lies, would I be commit the most blasphemy of all time? Would I be saying the most? <clears throat> Would I commit the sin of blasphemy for insulting the very great institution that must bestow my wisdom for it to be recognized? Would I say the greatest insult of all time to the infrastructure that must give me the official letters to recognize and validate, oh dear, what I say to be certified and the degree as proof that I have the right to say so and be so? I must stop right now the writing of long sentences. I am trying too hard to explain something very simple. I'm afraid of not being comprehended. I'm afraid to know that most people do not know that they shall not bring their tolerance where the sun does not shine. I'm afraid to not be tolerated Here is my attempt at making it short. <clears throat> Bijamukulu, please hold my space. Slavery was never ended. It was transformed. Slavery has never been ended. It has been transformed. In our year 2020, this year that I call quarantine age, Many of us on clave in our homes in confinement. If slavery was abolished, why do we see slavery in slow motion filming? I now open my screen with cautious and anxiety. Mm. If slavery was ended, when you type George Floyd, is a very moving image that passes where he couldn't breathe and he didn't get any help. As a child born in the continent of Africa, I was told many stories 
almost every African cultures have storytellers. Those stories come with lessons to carry on for future learnings. Most of the stories I've told in storytelling are stories I heard as a child and I retell them. They are retold. Stories told to me that I've told to you and many other people. At the end of last show Thursday, I think it was the last Q&A question by my wonderful Ndogu, Joyce Revit. Why the movement are so segregated? The Black Lives Matters, they meet somewhere and sometimes you see groups are segregated. I left the show thinking a lot about that question. Even though I gave an answer, I didn't feel the answer I gave was enlightened. It was a question that needed healing and enlightenment as, an, as a response. Then for the first time, I came up with my own story. For the first time, I woke up with a story that had the animal characters just the way I was told with a lesson and a meaning to the question that was asked. Would you like to hear the story and the storytelling? Since you are muted, I will say yes for you. For the sake of Zoom time, we may not have enough time for me to tell the story. I encourage you to follow up with me and Annie and see how we Put it in a book. And Joyce, if you would like a Zoom meeting where I tell you the storytelling, please do. Anyone else, please do. Since this Zoom time will have its own limited time. And that story, as the way I was told, there are animals characters. They may be strong and voracious in real life. But when they are told in stories, they carry meanings and an answer to questions that we have in life. It's not my, uh, my, I didn't, I don't want you to think about the story just for time on Zoom theater. We may not have enough time for me to tell the story, unfortunately. We'll tell it, Simba, and um. You know, it's definitely, will, you should make a nice book with it. It's a beautiful story. And we'll record it and we could send it to the audience too, if you want, or whatever you want to do. My Ndugu Annie has heard it. Yeah, and the beautiful thing is from a question from last week, you had a vision. Yes. Of, and the story and manifesto, yeah? Yes. So Simba, throw me the ball back. Are you ready, Annie? I'm ready, ready. All right, touch it. Well, well it turned into a lemon. Oh no, <laughs> let's make lemonade. As you know, this is, uh, this is my only tactile company, you know? Anyways, um, I see, I, I got a request too from the waiting room. So I, um, my, my Ndugu Ronnie's in the waiting room and, uh, Ronnie asked me to read this poem. Ronnie loves this poem. So I'm going to read this poem, and then we're going to open it up to questions and keep talking. This poem's called Nerina, and it's for my Ndugu Ronnie. Nerina slid right up to my leg, a little black cat, up the part of the mountain known as San Gregorio, between Messina and Palermo. Nerina lived on a little dirt road without a name. Houses built right into the mountainside, olive trees growing up the steep rise. When Nerina was born, they thought he was a girl. So they named him the feminine Nerina. In time, they saw he was a boy, but by then the name stuck. Nerina visits neighbors and Paisani across the road and up the hill. He lives with Felicia and Zeus the dog. 
and Felicia's son's family. Felicia and I met for one hour in life. She was 94, and it took me half my life to get up to the mountain. Life is one brief visit, and Felicia and I both know it. We greeted each other that way, and then we said goodbye that way. Felicia winked her one good eye, and in that wink, she said all this, enjoy your life. How blessed I feel to have met you for this one hour. How lucky, you're so beautiful. I'll treasure this hour. This is an hour never to be forgotten. You smile in my heart now, forever. She handed me a giant zucchini and I went on my way back down the mountain. Although I would have loved to stay there forever for Felicia to take me in like Nerina the cat. Nerina visits Stefania, the neighbor, who says, Flori, Flori, outside, outside, when he climbs the fence. Si vieni dentro, voi latte, si offri latte, voi cibo. Si offro cibo, sempre ritornerà. If you come inside, you want milk. If I give you milk, you want food. If I give you food, you'll stay forever. How much I feel like Nerina. Strangers call me sir, though I am a girl. Children refer to me as he. So quickly they're conditioned as to what a girl should look like. But when the word he is spoken in a child's voice to me, I can't help but feel they perceive some part of my inner nature. I am not feral, I am not stray. Like Nerina, I too have a name. I used to live in a house with a family, but that is all in the past now. The people have died or moved on and I walk alone in this world, in this apartment. I have keys to a door, the windows I leave open so a wind can come and shake things up. From place to place I wander, into friends' houses where I sit at their tables and I visit with their families. My species organizes itself into these tiny groupings called families. Perhaps I need to change species, find one that organizes more broadly. An unlocked door, warmth inside, emanating from the hearth. A woman who waves me in saying, come in, take off your shoes. We've been waiting for you, welcome home. The kettle's on, stay as long as you like. Here's a job you could do. You're one of us now. This is what I dream of, just to belong, to have a role. Friends welcome me, but the clock is there too and the calendar always tallying goodbyes. I sleep on couches and floors, on porches and in beds and spare rooms, basements, but something always gives. Like Nerina, I sidle up to places and people, hoping someone, someday, someplace sticks. All right, that's for you, Ronnie. All right, we're gonna open it up to questions, Simba, so we can continue this discussion. So let's right. see. You, you wanna do uh, the two, I heard some, I saw someone ask, you wanna do poems? It's, uh, since I can't do the stories, I'll read two poems too. Yeah, read two poems, absolutely. And yes, that's yes, what your questions come in and all your thoughts. All right, yes. two poems. Two poems. No one waiting. When I fall, I don't stay down. I pick myself up and start the road again. I dust off and start the road again. I catch up and keep going. Even if no one waited for me, no one will be waiting for me. There's another poem I'll share and we'll open for questions. A39 and counting. Stay a little while longer. Sit up there and watch a little while longer. Land a hand 
and send another sitting message. Every now and then, I put my left arms on my centered heart, tilted to the left. Hmm. A kindred, oh, go ahead. Sorry. A kindred hearted and soul told me a way to reach to where you are. A little longer before I pick my fragment pieces and make whole. My goodbyes are not for today. While my busy soul hasn't cried its cleansing soul. The road is still long from where I stand and the struggle is still real. Help me breathe. Unquatishi. I can't call 911. Look at my skin. Chena nkumba nankayanye. Be my mimvum. My countings. Mm. Oh, Simba. Before we open it up, you got to teach them the phrase. Oh, yes. That's so this the story. So tell them what it has to do with the story. So the... It, this has to do with the story that I couldn't tell today because of time, and it's in Luba, Luba, Luba Katanga. So my mother speaks Luba Kasai, my father speaks Luba Katanga. Iluano Lualo, le Luayo Luanj. All right, let's unmute everybody, and we could all practice it in a call and response. So Simba, we'll repeat after you. <clears throat> I'll wait a little bit for everyone to get unmuted. They will, I think they're kind of ready. <laughs> All right. Unmute yourself. Lulu, we want to unmute yourself. And um, pin Simba so you pin her. Iluano Lualo Iluano Lualo Luanji This is the story and its lessons. This is the story and its lessons. Iluano Lualo Every story has a lesson. What was that phrase? The way you phrased it. Say that again. You said something like every story has a lesson. Every lesson, you had like a, a way to phrase that. Yeah, translation is not. Uh, let me see. Um, Every story has every, no every question has its story and every story has its lesson. Mm. Every question has, has its, its story, story. And, every story and every story has, has its, its lesson. 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 Uh, Sa Sa Simba, there's a question from Sasha Silverstein. Hi, Sasha. Hi, darling. Hi. <laughs> you could ask yourself, she wants to know a little bit about the story and maybe the meaning of it at least. Go ahead, Sasha, ask her. I don't think that was me, but go ahead. I, want, I would like to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it so, was... Well, somebody, the, can we hear a little bit about the story? Oh, it was when, so when um, Joyce asked the question and I kept thinking, uh, the response because I saw her being in that space of healing. We all in that space where we need healing, and it just felt like my my response. And I kept thinking, I don't think my response was. Uh, I think it was toward the end. So I went to sleep and I woke up. I was like, oh, I got the response. And in the story, character is about waiting. She was worried about how um, the Black Lives Matters people needed their space. She was wondering why are they on their own? And 
I think my Nduku Audrey had that experience too of you see a lot of African Americans that need that space. Since slavery was never abolished, they were never given that space to heal. And when they see my Ndugu Annie, if someone sees my Ndugu Annie, they don't know that she's my Ndugu Annie. And it comes from, yeah. It's very interesting that um, in this, in another, in an, so it's this space. They need their space to heal. It was never given. They've been walking, we've been walking around with this fear. And it's, I'm looking at the story of the two uh, Coopers in the park, Amy Cooper and Christian Cooper. Amy, when the story happened after, afterwards, CNN interviewed Amy Cooper and she said, I was scared, I was afraid. Yeah, there was fear. But was, was Christian Cooper scared and afraid? His fear is very real very real and palpable. Like his fear will happen. The police will come and they will shoot him. He will die. That's, but Amy's fear, you have to search and look for the point where it becomes a little bit mythical because there's no fear of a black person coming to attack you for just no reason. Simba, is that your mom out there? My mom is there. Mama. <laughs> yes, my, my mom figured out how to get into Zoom. Let's see, Mama. Can she unmute herself? Uh, Mama, Obambi ele mensagem lorei, Obambi a mukika sai lorei da nai. My mom is there. Let me see if I see her. All right, if you, uh, you uh, oh, there she is. Aha, kano shabai ka bilima. Hello. Diko ba diko ka to. To. Lekela no lekela. Kano shabai ka diko ba diko ka to. Oh. Everyone wave to uh, Anne. <laughs> Simba, translate. Uh, when I'm America. Yeah, Mama, I'm going to be in Wangle. But I'm going to be in Wangle. But I'm going to be in so my mom always find herself in places where everybody talks and she said, what did they say? So that's good for her right now. You guys are asking, what did she say? <laughs> <laughs> she lived in the United States always asking, what did they say? Mama, I said, I'm going to say, 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 I'm So I just translated. <laughs> For my mom, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's your turn. You ask, what did she say? It's the the message I shared last time that she went in the protest. She said, "Bena America, please, please stop killing our son of the dark skin." Oh. I see that. Um. Oh, here, Simka wants Ra uh, Rabbi Simka says something. Rabbi, where are you? Say here it. I am. Here I am. Can you uh, read us what in the chat? Yeah, my most recent thing, people fear that if black people get space, they will lose their space when there is more than enough space for all. Lack of trust but besides hatred and dehumanization. Mm. Thank you, Simka. Simka, I quote you all the time to everybody. That's mutual. <laughs> Oh, I have a theory about racism. <laughs> okay, this is a dangerous thing to say. I think, Simba, you listening? Yes. Okay, I think the reason black people are hated by white people, let's just, let's put it in terms of black and white. Normally I don't talk like that, but for right now I'm putting it in that those terms. Is because it's hatred of the mother. Everybody resents their mother at one time in a month, in, a, in their lifetime, like teenagers. Any white person who's ever gone to Africa, not as a colonialist, maybe even the colonialists, you, as soon as you step foot on Africa, you know you're home. Mm. In fact, people say to you, welcome home. You know that's the womb of civilization. 
If the Middle East is the cradle, Africa is the womb of civilization. And I feel there's something about it from geologic times with the Pangea when all the continents were together and Africa, you could Jersey to Africa. I feel it's hatred of the mother. Anyway, that's my theory. I see in the audience, we have the valedictorian of the eighth grade, Esther. And I want to know if there's any youth wisdom. Can you give us a three sentence valedictory speech? Uh, yeah, sure. Speak it to me, Esther. Let me hear your wisdom to the world. Well, the speech that I was told to write is mainly just thank you. So, anyways, here's what I've written in my notes app. Uh, this is from my father, who we all know aspires to be a rapper. So, he was the writer behind this. My name is Esther G. Here's my valedictory. Um, so, this is my Oscar speech. It is because of my parents, my family, and because of people like Annie in my life that I view the world with an interest and a desire to learn. So thank you especially Annie and Simba for being incredible teachers and artists and for making the world beautiful and in general just being amazing. There you go, that's my speech. Esther, you know, you're my Ndugu too. Yeah, you are too. Ndugu mm -hmm. Esther, thank you. Congratulations Esther, please grow up and change the world soon, even before you grow up, don't even wait. Please. I won't. Thank you. <laughs> Love you, Esther. Um, Simba, we didn't really define Ndugu for this crowd. Why don't you just repeat, you know, what you said last week? What is Ndugu? I come with my flows. You come with yours. We see each other through the lens of love. I come with my flows. You bring yours. When I met my Ndugu, Annie and Audrey, I had a lot of flows. Being born in the Congo and have King Leopold II as a, as a, as a colonizer, yes, I had a lot of flaws. But they saw me through the lens of love. And we had quite a few flaws and still. <laughs> yeah, we still do. But the lens of love is the most important thing in Dubu. Yeah, the lens of love, yeah. yeah. Um, well, all right, listen, we're going to open up this discussion. Uh, I guess officially we've reached our time. If you want to go, go. If you want to hang, hang. If you want to talk, talk. Maybe the rabbi could impart some wisdom upon us. And, um, and maybe Simba will tell some of her story. We'll see. Anything else from the crowd, from the gallery? I'm I just want to um, I want to say ditto to what I just read. Who are you? Who are you? Uh, my name's Audrey. Hi, I'm, I'm Dugu Audrey. Dugu. I just read exactly what I was thinking. So thank you, Neil Goldberg, because it's true. Lens of Love sounds exactly like Lancelotto. <laughs> <laughs> lens of Love is Lancelotto. It came from Cataplexy just to say that. <laughs> Jennifer, Jennifer, Mbui. So, Mbui, that's Audrey. Audrey's Mbui. It's just that's, uh, that's, that's, I can hear more how writing has felt through the confinement. I don't know who Jennifer is, but. Je uh, uh, Annie, say that again. Oh, uh, let Jennifer say it. Jennifer, unmute yourself. Hola. Hola. Oh, Jennifer. Jennifer Rodriguez. Oh, oh my wow. Wow. sardine. Yeah, why not? Ah, <laughs> my fufu girl with sardine. <laughs> See, that's my praise for my Ndugu. She's in Ndugu. So you can all do that. Like, you know, find some praise for your Ndugus. Yes, go ahead, Jennifer. I want to hear you more. Thank you. No, you had a question, Jennifer. If... I want to hear you more about how writing has felt throughout confinement and the times that you are living right now. Writing in confinement, I, um, my Ndugu Audrey, okay. I think there was like a lot of Ndugu love that helped me, like my Ndugu Annie, my Ndugu Audrey, I was, I was writer block for a long time. 
my grandmother passed, boom, I started to write. And things were just coming in and vision. And I told my grandmother, come in my dream. I told King George, come in my dream. He came in my dream too. And my grandmother, and I've just been writing from grief. I didn't, I've, I've been in, conf this is my double confinement. I'm in my double confinement. I'm darker. So that this is my double confinement. So confinement was new to a lot of people. It was very familiar to me. The grief in my double confinement open up my writing vortex. I felt like my grandmother, my mother told me a story. Mama, my grandmother has passed and I was in confinement with my mother. And she took a pen. So we, we were in the apartment because I was quarantining with my mom. Um, and after her mother passed, she took a pen and she remembered. One time she came from school and her school report, the report card had to be signed. So her father knew how to write. He was the one that usually signed. But that day he wasn't home. And then she asked her mother, like my, my report card has to be signed. And she showed me how my grandmother took the pen and very slowly, like when you write in Galula, it would take you about half a second. She took about two to three minutes or five minutes writing Galula. So when I was writing, that was my grandmother writing all her life she needed to write and after she had passed i've been writing so much but it happened after my grandmother's death and when my mother told me the story of her taking long time to write and how after her death just my writer's blog that has been blocked for for a long time i've been writing as a teacher report card and stuff but the creative writing that i haven't done in a long time so that's slow writing she practiced now we had speed up when she passed through me and say, you go ahead and write. Since Simba. I couldn't. Simba. Yes. We have a guest from Little Rock, Arkansas, an activist, Tufara. Can you please unmute yourself? And I'm gonna quote Tufara with her permission. I have a cousin in Little Rock, Arkansas. Do you? Yes. What's I do. Bibi Mwamba. So look for Bibi Mwamba. Bantu Not. Bantu Not Radio. Ah, oh, she's married to my friend Charles. Hey, we on the same radio. Hey, 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 that's, my, that's my sister. That's my sister. <laughs> oh, we should talk. We should talk. Yeah. I know her sister too. Oh, nice. And that's how that works, right? <laughs> too far as one of my. Googles. <laughs> <laughs> Tufara is one of my beloved, beloved heroes. And I want to say that you taught me many things, many things. But one thing, because, you know, we're dealing with uh, taking down statues of oppressors. And the Italians are in the middle of it because they're protecting, a lot of Italians are protecting these statues of Columbus. And um, I recently told a group of Italians what you told me, which impacted me greatly. If somebody raped your grandmother, would you want to have to walk by a statue of them every day? Can you say that again, please? Too far. I hope I'm not saying it the wrong way. If somebody raped your grandmother, would you want to have to walk by a statue of them every day? And to me, that's the bottom line on all these statues. Too far, you don't have to speak on that particularly, but I do want you to speak, please. Because you know I love you. I love you too, but I don't know what you want me to talk about other than that. You said how I feel about it. I mean, our country is full of statues and each time I see them, being the the Southern woman that I am, I, I, am, I, I remember the brutal history of this country. So that's that's my truth. I mean, the that's other, my truth. You know, the other thing you, that impressed me recently 
you put on Facebook, you said, just in case you're going to ask me how I am, I'm not okay. So now you know. Yeah, I'm not. I ain't been okay in a long time. I mean, what? if you think about what, what we're consistently being shown over and over again, I'm tired of looking at people that look like me die on TV. Not just on this, on this particular continent, but on all of them. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. So, I mean, that's the reality. It, I, I, I don't know if in fact all lives matter, then why I got to keep seeing myself die over and over and over again. It's not just, it's not fair. And that's how I feel about it. I don't have much more to say about it, but I'm not okay and I ain't been okay in a long time. And I don't think I'm alone. No, thank you. I mean, I'm, no. I'm, I'm not alone in it at all. And, and oh, even no. if, if white people say they all right, they lying too. No. I had a little sister tell me this the other day. And it was, it was actually a, a, a sister who would identify herself as white. And she said, if you are what you eat, then I too owe a lot to black women because I realized that my ancestors used African wet nurses. Mm. We not that disconnected. Mm. So I'm a, with that, I'm a hush. <laughs> I love you, Annie. Well, I love you and uh, you know, you have a great impact on me and many others. Thank you, Tufara. Um, Steve wants me to, um, he says, perhaps every story leaves you hanging and this one may too. He wants me to craft an ending to this moment, but still some of us could hang out, right? Steve, why don't you unmute yourself? That's right. People every, every story, uh, needs an ending and it might not be living happily ever after uh, in this case, but the story ends and then a new story begins when people hang out. So could we call this transition to the after hangout for anyone who wants to hang out and talk? That's exactly right. Okay, so then, then I'll just say... Um, Thank you so much, Steve. Say, and what? the whole team at City Law. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Simba. Sorry. Okay. Thank you to the team at City Law. Elva, um, can see it. Eva and Molly and everybody Eva else. Eva and Molly and everybody else. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you all for coming. Uh, it, it's, been, it, it's been our very first streaming conversation, and it's been profound. And I, I'm glad you were, you've all been here to be part of it. And thank you, Simba Nani. And let's give them all a big hand. All right. Okay. Love you, Simba and Annie. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo so now we're going to keep. That's Emily. Whoever <laughs> hang out. Thank you, Steve. <laughs>